Welcome back, everyone. I am Cass Piancy, and I'm here as usual with my partner in crime, Bennett Tomlin, who he's doing good. He's doing good. It's fine. <laughs> More importantly, <laughs> we're here with a guest that I'm very excited about, Elizabeth Lopato from The Verge. You are deputy editor of The Verge, and you've been covering the Elizabeth Holmes Theranos trial. So welcome. How are you? I'm great. You know, better slept than I've been in about four months, so that's very exciting. <laughs> <laughs> Good, good. I'm glad to hear that. To start this, I, I think maybe there's some people out there who for, for some reason, somehow, some way, don't know what this is all about. So maybe you could just fill everyone in and do a recap of why Elizabeth Holmes was on trial at all. Sure, yeah. Um... So this is just very recent history. For a while, there was this big, splashy startup called Theranos. It was one of the unicorns. People were super excited about it. And they promised they were going to revolutionize blood testing technology. And how they were going to do that was, you know, they were going to take a finger prick sample, and then they could do every test on the finger prick sample. And then uh, this article came out in the Wall Street Journal, written by a guy named John Carreyrou, that was like, oh, hey, that's not true. And that was sort of the beginning of the end for Theranos, which went bankrupt in 2018. And uh, the SEC got involved, as the SEC sometimes does, and they referred the case over to the DOJ for criminal charges. And so after sort of this uh, dragged out period of negotiation about what could and couldn't go into the trial and what evidence the jury could see and all of those things, plus the coronavirus pandemic, um, in September 2021, we all sort of began... Uh, going through the evidence against Elizabeth Holmes, who has ultimately been, been found guilty of four counts to one of them is conspiracy to commit uh, investor fraud, and the other three are wire fraud charges. And so she uh, is not yet sentenced. I imagine she will appeal, but I also think it's been uh, a pretty wild ride since 2015. Yeah, and there's already... I, I, not to jump into this too soon, but we might as well get it um, out of the way. There's already been a lot of rumors and discussion about the sentencing phase and what people are expecting. John Carreyrou, who you mentioned, uh, has a podcast called Bad Blood, if anyone wants to. He has been on top of this from the very beginning till the very end. And he released an episode this morning, and he seems to expect that she is going to get prison time. His, his guess was five years serving three. And from what I've heard from lawyers on Twitter, not that that says much, but lawyers on Twitter are um, suggesting somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 to 15 years. And then Carrie Rue's co-host, who, forgive me, I, I Emily. Don't... Emily Saul, yeah. Emily, thank you. Emily Saul suggested that she's possibly not going to do any time at all. You know, you're I, you're a reporter, you're not a lawyer, uh, but I'd still love to hear your opinion on that in general. Well, I, I got to know Emily pretty well during the course of the trial because all of us who were there every day got to know each other pretty well. We like trauma bonded. <laughs> <laughs> I'm inclined to think that Emily knows what she's talking about. She's a really knowledgeable legal reporter. That said, I will be surprised if she doesn't see some prison time. Because the thing is, this Holmes trial, the whole thing, Theranos, all of it, was such a circus that I feel like there's a point to prove here that you can't get away with it. And, you know... I noticed uh, that the judge who will be doing the sentencing, Edward Davila, he made a point of being absolutely as fair as he possibly could be to Holmes and to her defense team, sometimes dragging the trial out a little bit longer than I thought it necessarily needed to go for this kind of fairness. And it makes me think that part of that is to avoid the possibility of an appeal or to, to knock down any kind of appeal that happens. But I also think part of it is to make the sentencing stick. So we'll see. Um, none of us know. It's all wild speculation, which is the most fun part. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, I will be very surprised um, if she doesn't get some minimum amount of jail time. And to clarify that, it's I, the rumor mill suggesting that she might not get any jail time. I, the reasons that I've heard are that she has never committed any offense before. She just had a baby and she was abused. She was abused by her boyfriend at the time, Sonny, who is also going to trial shortly. But uh, that that is that's the spec that's the reason there's speculation about that at all. Yeah, and look. Um... 
you know, Emily's read on it on that podcast was that she'll get ordered to pay restitution to those investors, right? Which it's it's not a small amount of restitution. I think it's over a hundred million dollars. So like that's not minor either. But again, I just think that this was such a big case that I would be surprised if that were the limit of it. Particularly because I know that there's a sort of sentiment about the way that the the, the verdict broke down that you know, again, Elizabeth Holmes is getting away with it. And what I mean is she was found guilty on four charges. There was a hung jury on three charges and all of those sort of fall into the investor bucket. But when it came to the patients, she was found not guilty. Um, and the conspiracy to defraud patients, she was also found not guilty. Now, I think that had to do with prosecutorial strategy, um, because I think it's a lot harder to prove her direct involvement to defraud patients. And I think that that patient testimony was really helpful in getting the investor convictions, which, by the way, carry more jail time. But... <laughs> I do think that there is a general sense that she's being punished for the wrong thing. Like ripping up off Betsy DeVos is like a little funny. Jeopardizing people's health yeah. is in, not funny. In terms funny. of society, it seems much worse to give someone a false HIV result than take a couple million from Betsy DeVos. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that there's going to be a you know, an open question about how much that sentiment comes into play when it's time for sentencing, because I've, I've certainly heard people, patients especially, expressing the sentiment that they're glad she got a conviction, but they also felt that their voices weren't really heard or they weren't really like, you know, people didn't understand the severity of what happened to them. So I'm, I'm curious to see if that the, the investor convictions stand in for the sort of more emotionally compelling convictions. And there's a, an element of that punishment there. Yeah, and uh, I, I think this has clearly been a very large case, one of probably the most important fraud cases we've seen in the last few years. And uh, yesterday, you published an article which ran with the headline, Elizabeth Holmes' verdict won't change Silicon Valley. And so I was uh, hoping you could talk with us a little bit about the dynamics of this case and why you think it won't have that much of a change on Silicon Valley or that culture. Yeah, well, I mean, one of the things that I've been a little bit shocked by is the sort of revisionist history I've heard from a lot of people in the tech world where they're like, oh, but Theranos wasn't really Silicon Valley. And it's like, yes, it was. I'm sorry, you guys were touting her as the successful female founder, like right up until the moment that she became radioactive. Like, give me a break here. Besides the people who were on the cap table, which include, by the way, Larry Ellison, Don Lucas, who, if you don't know him, was an early investor in Oracle. You know, these guys like really brought cred to Theranos and they were early investors. Like they were important. You have um, Mark Andreessen running around saying she's the next Steve Jobs. He's deleted those tweets now, but <laughs> I still remember. The internet never forgets. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And Tim Tim Draper, let's, let's not forget Tim Draper, who still touts her. He says that if it had just gone out as a beta, she wouldn't be doing jail time right now. Like comparing blood tests to software. Uh -huh. It's just insane. Well, this was one of the things when I first saw the Carrie Rue article, I pulled the cap table um, because I wanted to see who the investors were. And it was, look, I'm not an investor. I'm not an expert. I'm just like a messy bitch who lives for drama. But if I am looking at a healthcare company, which is what Theranos was, and I don't see major healthcare investors on your cap table, I have questions about why they're not there. And that was one of the things very early on that suggested that I, that Carrie Rue's reporting was accurate, was that a lot of these these uh, investors were family offices. Um, so, you know, not necessarily expert in the area. There was one firm that was, I think it was PCM, that was, that did have a healthcare business, but that was it pretty much like this was not like something where you're seeing major biotech firms involved. And one of the reasons why for me, that's a, a red flag is that at a lot of those big um, investment firms in the healthcare industry, like everyone has an MD. It's not like you have a doctor on staff. The investors are doctors and they're specialists in the areas that they invest in. So if you have somebody who's like doing the diagnostics investing, like they know their 
and like they can get into your data in a very real way. And if you're not going to give them your data, they're not going to invest. So there was that. But the other thing that I noticed is that it was happening, like these, these investments in Theranos were happening during a period when it was very hot to invest in startups. And like people were really competitive, like trying to get into like the hot startups, like not doing the due diligence that they needed to be doing, which like if people, you know, again, had been paying attention, like Theranos didn't have an audited financial statement after 2012 because of some like uh, stock option grants that there were um, questions about, let's say. And to me, again, that that seems like it's probably a red flag. But, you know, people were like the Lisa, I'm forgetting her last name, but she was uh, running the DeVos fund. And she was saying, like, we didn't want to dig too deep because we didn't want to you know, offend Elizabeth and get shut out of this round. Like we, we wanted to get in. And I was reading the Wall Street Journal this weekend. Um, and I noticed that Elliot Brown had written an article about how, and again, investors aren't doing due diligence because there's so much money sloshing around that they are competing for the good companies. And to me, that's just like one of those moments where you're like, uh, oh, gonna happen again we've learned nothing like not only are, do we have our heads in the sand about how like this contributed you know how silicon valley's culture contributed to this like we're not doing the basic sort of due diligence that the investors in theranos mostly did not do so you know uh we've learned nothing <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah that's the lesson here very sorry <laughs> Yeah, I, I if you don't mind, I actually want to quote from that article for a second here, uh, because you you end it with because if we've learned anything, it's this: the startup founders exaggerating what their companies are capable of are the ones who take the fall, but only if they get caught red-handed, like Holmes did. Thankfully for investors and the startup hype cycle, you don't go to jail for being a sucker, and that resonates a lot for me just because of what Bennett and I tend to cover when it comes to the crypto world you're seeing it more and more and more it's it's a really interesting dynamic though because i th it's just yeah you're so right in that i feel like there's more and more risk on but less and less founders and individuals who want to take responsibility for that risk if there's problems. I, I don't know. It, it, it's mind boggling to me as as we're watching Elizabeth Holmes get a guilty sentence and not be allowed to work as uh, an executive officer for what, 10, 10 years, a decade. So, yeah, it's cra it's crazy. It's a crazy dynamic. You know, I, I started um, in journalism I got my my first internship in 2006 and my first job in 2007. Um, so I had a front row seat for the financial crisis because I was working at Bloomberg at the time. And, you know, I do remember in 2007, early 2007, before it started to hit the fan, people were saying going to hit the fan. And everyone said, no, 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 it'll be different this time. No, <laughs> no, no, it'll be. And then, you know, when did start to hit the fan. I think it, the first crack was a Bear Stearns fund that went belly up. Then it moved on to, oh, well, it'll just stay contained to the housing sector. Oh, oh, we'll keep it contained. And obviously not. But I think that there is like this level of denial that comes along with the kind of optimism that we see during bull markets. And obviously we've been seeing a really long bull market, right? Like if you became an adult after... I don't know, 2009, stocks only go up. Uh, you've never seen a correction, really, like not a serious one. You've never seen a recession. Um, and so I think that like there is a temptation to think that people are being some in some way cruel or unfair when they express skepticism. And I think that's where like the FUD acronym actually comes from. It's like, oh, you're spreading fear, uncertainty and doubt. And it's like, well, that's just life, man. Like, <laughs> like sometimes you feel good, sometimes you don't. I don't know what to tell you about that. But if you if you don't have this experience of watching the market just like in free fall, I can certainly understand why you wouldn't believe that it could happen. Yeah, certainly. And one of the dynamics, I'm going back to the thing you mentioned about the DeVos family office, basically not wanting to ask too many questions because they might get locked out of the round. That just resonated for me with some of the coverage Cass and I do with crypto because we end up covering a lot of A16Z and these other VC funds that are investing in these very early token projects. And often when I'll go to like look at the project, I will find like math errors in the white paper or things like not adding up in the way these things are supposed to work. And when I've asked people 
in the industry, like, why are these firms not doing any due diligence? The answer is, like, these rounds sometimes close in 24 hours. There's literally not even the time for them to invest into due diligence or they'll be locked out of the round. And so I think it, it's just striking to me to see those uh, same dynamics resurfacing in this uh, slightly different field. I really think that just to like step back for a minute, one of the things that I am persistently interested in is not like money per se, companies per se, stocks per se, or crypto per se, but I'm really interested in human behavior. And one of the things that I really love about crypto is that there's a public blockchain and I can just be in your business whenever I want to be. I love that. Like I am, I, I love being in other people's business. And so it's, interesting to me that you see the same patterns of behavior over and over um, in, in economic behavior, but it sort of is universal. It's not just limited to, oh, people behave one way in stocks and another way in bonds and another way in crypto. No, no. Uh, we're all delusional in the same ways. The human mind works the same way. And you see these patterns of, of how people get caught, how people get tricked, how people create narratives that don't serve them. Um, and it's the same thing, you know? And so I really think that like, if you are thinking of becoming an investor in anything, it really is worth your time time to learn about manias, panics, and bubbles. Uh, it's worth your time to like look into how fraud occurs because even though like the mechanisms might be slightly different depending on what asset class you're, you're in, uh, the psychology is going to be basically the same. And this has been going on for hundreds of years, hundred thousands of years, probably. Um, but I was I was having this exact conversation with a friend of mine the other day because we were talking about Theranos. And it is it it is so you see it over and over and over again. The first fraud that I did a big deep dive on that I just really wanted to learn everything about was WorldCom because I felt like everyone had so sort of forgotten about it. It was just everyone remembers Enron. No one remembers WorldCom. And reading about it, reading about Cynthia Cooper, who was the auditor who figured it all out and her being like, yeah, they made a mistake. And then essentially that mistake compounded. Like, I don't think any of them woke up and said, I'm going to be a giant fraudster today. And you're like, that is all of this. That's like, that is Enron. That is Theranos. That's being a little kid and not wanting to tell your mom that you took a cookie from the cookie jar or whatever. Like, mistakes just compound if you don't take responsibility. But then also, there's a truth to, like, sometimes you can get away with it. Yeah. Which is why they do it, right? I, you know, I watching the trial, I have now a personal narrative of of how Theranos went down, which I'm going to share with you guys. Again, this is just what I think. It's not what God thinks. It's not what the truth is insofar as the truth is a knowable thing, which is another subject for another time. But according to the prosecution, the fraud started around 2009. And again, if you think back, that's a period after the financial crisis when funding was really tight. It was really difficult to get money. And Theranos was burning a lot of cash. And so I can certainly imagine Elizabeth Holmes saying to herself, well, we're so close to doing this thing that we might as well just say it. And then when we get the money, then we'll have done it and no one will know the difference. And then from there, I can just imagine it compounding because it turns out that there was some problem. It was harder than she thought it was going to be. But you still have this enormous cash burn. And then from there, it just it's like um, that video game Katamari Damacy, where you like start with like a tiny little ball and you wind up rolling up the whole world. Like it just kept, you know, getting bigger and bigger and bigger as she was like scrambling to try to like make this thing work. So, yeah, I don't I like I certainly don't imagine that when she founded Theranos in 2006, she was like, I'm going to do a fraud. No, I think she really thought she was going to change the world. I think she was thought she was going to do something good for people. And I think that also is part of the reason her pitch was so compelling. Like you listened in the courtroom, we listened to a lot of her investors talking about, you know, the vision for Theranos and why they thought it was amazing. And like, especially listening to James Mattis, who was a board member, like he was so he was like such a true believer in the possibility that this kind of blood testing would save so many lives, especially military lives and like it was, you could see why he was such a big cheerleader because he was like holy shit, like this is like this could this could really change things like why wouldn't lose so many men like to some degree she was selling hope and we all like hope you know do you have any favorite stories of the way that elizabeth holmes would try to sell hope the things she would do to try to deceive 
Man, uh, I think actually the James Mattis story is probably my favorite. So she ran into him backstage before he was about to do a speech and she like pricked his finger as a demonstrative and was like, this is this is the tech. And he was like, can we test it? And she was like, we can deploy it right away. And he was like, let's go. And I just like there was such a um, like a fairy tale quality to that, like like Sleeping Beauty pricking her finger on the like the spinning wheel that it stuck with me like you know this this demonstrative of like i'll prick your finger here a couple drops of blood and i'll be able to do everything with them um i can certainly see why somebody would be like this is incredible hell yeah particularly when you think about like you know the conditions that he's familiar with in places like afghanistan where you can't really have a full lab so the idea that you would be able to do this with a small device and a little bit of blood like whew, you know, I, I, I'm certain like he immediately just saw visions of all of the men he could save and was like, great, let's go. Yeah, which brings me to uh, you. You wrote another article about Elizabeth Holmes always being in charge. But what I found really compelling about that was kind of your descriptors of Holmes in court. And honestly, listening to Carrie Rue and listening and, and reading other your epic tweet threads while you were there. All I hear here is that she was very stoic. And again, like she was in control of herself. But you also hear that about other other um, individuals like Ghislaine, Ghislaine Maxwell, if anyone is, again, if anyone is unfamiliar, uh, <laughs> Epstein's co-conspirator. Co but what I would hear about in those trials and about her in general is that there would be like moments where she would lose control. And you would hear the same about Elizabeth Holmes, like in terms of when she was boss. Like there were moments where she would be very rude or cruel. It doesn't sound like at any point she lost control in the courtroom. It seems like she was totally, like you say, like she she had control of the narrative. And that just seems a little different than most people who are going on trial and, and going up and getting cross-examined. You know, I was really struck specifically by her posture because... I, th I think she must have great abs, like just just to be blunt about it, because <laughs> I was like slumping by the end of the day and I could see her lawyers like wilting around her and she was still just absolutely straight up. So good on her for that. Uh, but, you know, I think one of the things that she really was good at was when she had control of a situation, she was really good at 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 using it. So there were times in her testimony, especially her direct testimony, where I felt she had probably rehearsed the answers. And like, part of the reason I felt that was because she really just gave a compelling delivery, like she really delivered it, you know? And so I can certainly imagine like if she's meeting with investors and she's had a chance to rehearse her roadshow, like I imagine she must have been killer. And the moments where she seemed to waver a little or seemed less certain were, was when she had to answer stuff on the fly. And so some of that was, a, I saw a little bit of that in her direct testimony when she was having to answer questions about stuff she had heard in the courtroom from other witnesses. But I was particularly struck by it on the cross because there was this moment with these memos. And for those of you who haven't been following this closely, there were these memos that had uh, the logos of drug companies at the tops that she presented to investors as, as uh, quote unquote proof that her technology had been verified by these companies, except that everything in those memos had been written by Theranos. Um, and she had edited them in places to make them even more uh, favorable than they already were. And so she admitted to that in the direct testimony that she had put the logos on top. And then on the cross, there were there were more questions about like why things got altered. And I watched her suddenly start to clam up and be like, I don't know who did that. I don't recall. I don't recall. Because like she realized like, oops, that doesn't look good. And there were a couple of other moments like that on the cross where you like you could see like the wheels turn. But particularly the last day of the cross, when I think she was tired, she started laughing a lot. And... I, I couldn't tell whether that was like frustration or anger or nervousness, but it wasn't like a happy laugh, you know? And I think that was the closest I really saw besides the moment that she was asked about um, her sexual assault at Sanford and cried that like she really lost control. And like 
when she did cry, it was not a production. Like she like tried to choke it back as, as quickly as she could. She did, I, I felt that she didn't want to look weak in that moment. That, that almost was despite herself. But aside from a couple of like those moments, it really felt like she just had this like iron self-control. And like the schedule that was presented uh, as part of the, the abuse testimony sort of spoke to that. And like there were these like, you know, she was getting up at like three in the morning and like thanking God and washing her face. And then, um, you know, like the sort of like regimented schedule. And then there were these like bizarre affirmations that are like, I will always do what I say. And, uh, you know, I am the leader and all of these sort of like really just intense, like things that she had written down. And, uh, you know, maybe this is just a personality thing. Um, I can't imagine treating myself that way. I really cannot. Like, I did get up really early. I did work pretty hard on this. But I can't imagine, like, being so unforgiving of myself that it's like, I will do everything I say. Like, I might be tired. I'm I'm, I'm going to do my best. But, like, if I can't do it, I can't do it. Like, that's just where it is. And there's, like, a lack of, like, self-forgiveness that I think maybe radiated out into the way that she treated other people without, like, being somebody's therapist because I'm, like, not qualified for that. Like, that was certainly the... The way that I felt about it was that she was really, really hard on herself, and she felt that gave her a license to be really, really hard on other people. I just, there, I don't know if they brought this up at trial, but there was a, an email that she like sent to herself that Carrie Rue also talks about in his podcast that was, they caught Mado, they won't catch you. And just like, I, just writing that in an email to yourself, like, it's like what you're talking about, where it's like, not only would I never do that, um, just cause it, I don't know, like, first of all, I, it's surprising to me that none of these people were considering paper trails and the consequences of putting this stuff in writing, but that is like a really scary and like you're saying, no self forgiveness, no, no, like real self empathy either, or acknowledging the thought of like, maybe I need to stop. <laughs> <laughs> I need to change. Yeah. <laughs> Look, I I feel really, really bad for all of the patients who got those bad test results. And I feel terrible for the people who worked at Theranos because we heard from Theranos employees and not a single one of them had a good time. It was not a good experience for any of them. And I imagine that's true for a lot of people we didn't hear from. You know, Erica Chung testified that uh, a lot of the lower level employees would sleep in their cars to try to make sure that things were running at the speed that they needed to be running at. That's horrible. That's awful. I'm so sorry. I also feel really sorry for Elizabeth Holmes, man. Like, I don't think it makes her any less culpable for what she did, but God, she's got to live with that all the time. And like, one of the things that I think... I, this was my impression and from what I've read of jurors impressions, you know, like, I think they also were relatively sympathetic to Holmes, but that wasn't going to let her off the hook. The sense that I got was that they didn't, they did about the same thing I did. And they were like, well, those abuse allegations, that sounds terrible if that happened, but it doesn't really seem super relevant. I'm, I'm very sorry, but also like, let's stay focused. I do think that they probably felt pretty sympathetic to her, but being sympathetic doesn't necessarily mean that that you're going to let something as big as that slide. Like, sympathy and accountability can coexist. Another thing that I've been thinking about a lot in regard to this trial and regard to kind of how the public in general feel about Elizabeth Holmes is it reminds me a lot of what happened to Martha Stewart. Now, granted, what happened to Martha Stewart, if, if anyone, again, here's another thing, if anyone is unfamiliar with what happened to Martha Stewart, she was found guilty of insider trading. The amount that she insider traded was like $50,000 or, or something ludicrously small. And she went to jail for like a, a year, so eight, 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 nine months, something like that, which is a lot of time when you're Martha Stewart and a billionaire and you traded $50,000 in there's people, let me put it this way, a lot of men doing far worse almost every day in the venture capital and uh, hedge fund world. So it felt a little targeted. And I guess I don't like using this word, but it did feel a little bit sexist in some sense. And I'm wondering if there's any kind of reflection similarly to this, or if this is just straight up like everyone's like, well, this was a massive fraud. That's it. Martha Stewart was not doing that. You know, um, Ellen Powell wrote, 
uh, an article about this in the New York Times for anybody who's curious. I do think that gender played a role in this. It played a role in Theranos' rise because for those of you who remember the rise, it was during a period when women were starting to say, hey, like Silicon Valley kind of sexist sometimes we've noticed. And like this idea that you should be at work all the time like that's that's actually like fundamentally discriminating against women who like rightly or wrongly often have more caregiving obligations than men do so like the structure here kind of f***ed up and around that time you have Sheryl Sandberg writing Lean In uh, the moral of which is that you should just work harder than the boys and then they will notice you which like not a great moral if you ask me personally but whatever and you have Elizabeth Holmes who you know really was like I'm the founder I don't do anything but this like I sometimes I sleep under my desk like when I go for runs I go through for runs through the hallways of Theranos which again like none of that seems like a person who's doing well if you ask me not a like mental health professional but that that seems not great. But that was like part of the reason she was being held up as this Silicon Valley poster girl was like the idea that like you can succeed if you just do it exactly like the boys. And look, here's Elizabeth Holmes doing it exactly like the boys. And so that was part of the reason I think she was being celebrated. I also think part of it had to do with like how difficult it is for women still to succeed in the STEM fields because of rampant discrimination. And so whenever you have someone who is succeeding, there is this, you know, temptation to make them into something bigger than they are. And so that that gave her sort of an outsized profile based on, you know, these, these sort of cultural dynamics that then I think really fed into her fall. Because if she hadn't been so well known, I wonder if, you know, we would have wound up with a, pr a criminal prosecution or if the SEC just would have like fined her and called it a day. And this this actually is another I think that a lot of people are discussing that a lot of people seem to think that the reason Elizabeth Holmes is being tried and found guilty of these very intense fraud charges is because she ripped off rich people. If she had just ripped off normal people, she wouldn't be facing those charges. Well, she she did rip off some normal people. I want to be clear, like PFM, one of the um one of the, the the charges she was found guilty of, I think that was thirty eight point three million dollars. That that was people's retirement funds. Like normal people did get ripped off. But I understand where people are coming from, where they're like, oh, justice is only for the rich. I think that it's an easier case to prove with the investors than it is for a lot of other things. And just by virtue of the fact that you have to be relatively rich to be an investor, that's a relatively limited class of people. Like I'm very glad there weren't pension funds in there, but like that doesn't you know, rule out the possibility that the next time we see a big fraud case like this, you know, it will be people's retirement savings and not just like, haha, Rupert Murdoch. Yeah. Obviously, you, you don't think that this is going to change anything in the future for Silicon Valley or venture capital. But do you think that these people who people like, let's I use the term Web3 or, uh, you know, we can talk about, you know, blockchain companies or whatever, crypto cryptocurrency companies. Do you think that a lot of them are maybe taking note of this, though, that they're that they are reflecting upon it and going like, oh, there can be serious consequences instead of just because I think for several years now, as Bennett said at the very beginning of this, this seems to be a really important case in finance simply because she's going to criminal court being tried for serious charges getting declared guilty and the maximum penalty could possibly be 20 years, right? Not that it will be, but, but the idea that you could end up doing that, like, do you think that that is giving any of these people pause or do you think it's still just like move fast, break things? I don't think it's giving any of these people pause at all. And I'll tell you why. I have a little list of folks in Web3 that I, f I follow. It's a little tweet deck column. And I have been keeping an eye on that because I am sort of endlessly fascinated by the behavioral dynamics there. And the main thing that these people seem to talk about is Web3 and absolutely nothing else. So I would be surprised if a bunch of them even had noticed this was happening. You know, they're busy. They've, they've got their hobby and it's really all consuming. And like, you know, maybe they've heard of Elizabeth Holmes, but they definitely haven't been following this. They're sleeping under their desks. They're running through their startup halls when they need to go for a run, making sure to build the future of the web as they go. <laughs> but but you you did mention Mr. Mark Andreessen as one of the investors in Theranos. So there's oh, no he wasn't, way. I want to be clear. He was not an investor in Theranos. He was just a big cheerleader for Elizabeth Holmes. 
Right. Okay. So he's a huge cheerleader. There's no way that he's not paying attention to this. He has to be. He's just remaining silent is my is what I suspect. I mean, in fairness, yes. And also Mark Andreessen blocked me many years ago, so I have no idea what he's doing on his Twitter account. Uh, I belong to a large group of people he has blocked, including Jack Dorsey most recently. So high five, Jack. Love being <laughs> in the club with you. But, you know, like I... I Again, like, I think if you're Mark Andreessen, the lesson here is a little bit about embarrassment more than anything else, right? Like, he's an investor. He's not, like, he's the person who potentially we use taxpayer dollars to, like, defend against fraud. He's not necessarily the person who is, like, performing fraud. So again, I don't know that there's an incentive for him to learn anything. I mean, I would love to know that I'm wrong. I would love for Mark Andreessen to unblock me and be like, look, Liz, I have learned my lesson, but I don't think that's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> I'm skeptical as well. And like, even in this case, the charges she was found guilty of and needs to pay restitution on are fraud against the investors. Like she's now obligated to try to repay the money that the investors were defrauded out of. So in theory, in the end, they'll be made whole despite the investment and participation in this fraud scheme. That's right. And I also think that if you're watching this closely and you're an investor, the person that you should be most scared of becoming is Alan Eisenman, who is far and away my favorite witness. They were like 30, I think 32 witnesses. And Alan Eisenman was an early investor in Theranos who reinvested and was the basis of one of the charges on which the jury hung. And he just got up on the stand and my God, did he just look like a f***ing idiot. Like, it was incredible. And like, he didn't make, he didn't cover himself in glory. You know, it was one of the funniest cross-examinations I've ever seen. And I've been in several court cases at this point. You know, at one point, uh, Holmes's lawyer asked him if he was a lawyer and he was like, no, I only went to law school. And after that, I only did tax law. And then her lawyer looking a little bewildered was like, you know, that tax lawyers are still lawyers, right? Like... <laughs> Oh my god. <laughs> it was so good. Like the real fear there is that you're going to get up on a, a stand in front of a bunch of reporters and just totally embarrass yourself and I'm going to call you a human cowboy boot on the verge. And like that, you know, that's like the worst thing that could happen to you, really, is like you're embarrassed and you're out of your money. Um, you know, it's not like you're But you you bring up a good point, which I think is like reputational risk, right? Like is don't do, do you think that that maybe is becoming more of a real thing these days like even if it's just supreme embarrassment and people being like ooh i wouldn't trust you with my money you know maybe i don't know man like like <laughs> one of the things about twitter is that i got to be real with you if i had enough money i just would not be on twitter ever and so it's just astonishing to me to see like millionaires and billionaires who are freely posting online and like collecting their l's because you, you know what else do they have to do they're billionaires i mean they <laughs> there's not there's nothing else I, you got to pick fights online i feel like that's that's the best way they could be possibly spending their time i feel like i would be like sitting on a beach drinking a pina colada and maybe reading a book i don't know like there are like there are things you can do with your life that are not taking l's online but like the willingness <laughs> that these folks like have to do that like astonishes me they're like willing to be embarrassed so that they can be part of the conversation and it suggests to me that maybe like reputational risk doesn't function the same way that it used to that notoriety is important and like the person i would point to is sort of the uh, the prime example here is Elon Musk, <laughs> who, again, very entertaining guy, very entertaining Twitter feed. I honestly kind of love that he can uh, accidentally tank cryptocurrencies just by like tweeting things or being on SNL. But like, you'd think that there would be some kind of like consequences for his 2018, maybe we're going to take Tesla private, oopsie, no, we're not. Oh, there's an SEC violation. And there isn't. There doesn't seem like that has, has done anything to make the people who are his fans any less his fans or any more skeptical about what he has to say and his predictions about the future. So I do wonder if we've like drifted free of reputational risks. I, I certainly think there's some evidence for that. I mean, we can talk about the attention economy or whatever you want to call it, but being notorious and having people pay attention to your name, whether you're famous or infamous, has value. One thing that I, I kind of want to discuss is that what I was struck when going through Bad Blood and listening to it is that it seemed like Theranos had a team that was quite good at getting media coverage, at bringing in certain journalists and places to try to cover what they were doing, and they were very stage-managed 
appearances often where they'd see only a small portion of the demo certain things were excluded and the people they were met with were coached on like what to discuss and so i kind of just want to know your thoughts on the appropriate way for journalists to cover a multi-billion dollar company claiming breakthroughs in science without peer-reviewed evidence. And like this, this isn't just Theranos because like when Elon Musk did his battery day, he's talking about the supposed improvement that the Maxwell purchase was going to have on Tesla's battery tech. And their tech had only been done in like a single cell test at that point. The kind of things he were claiming had never been tested or verified in any peer-reviewed way. And Still then, when that was announced, you had a bunch of purely laudatory coverage. And so I'm, I really just kind of want your thoughts on that kind of dynamic and the best way to m mitigate, manage, or incentivize it to be better. I think it's tough. One of the things that is true about journalism is that you assume that if a CEO tells you something, they're in a position to know, like a much better position than you. And they're probably telling the truth because most of the time people are telling you the truth, right? Like generally that is, that is how people function. Like sometimes people lie to you, but like that's rarer when it comes to something like scientific claims. I really love peer reviewed evidence. That to me is the gold standard. If you're saying something without the peer reviewed evidence, and by the way, this is actually very common. Um, and this happens at medical conferences because the conference presentations are not peer reviewed. Usually there's sort of a preview of something that you're going to see in a medical journal later. And like the conference itself is part of the peer review process when people like ask questions and things. I think one thing to note is, you know, where it is on the sort of spectrum of a reliability, right? Like you can tell the audience, he said without pointing to any evidence or so-and-so claimed without providing underlying details. Um, because for better or worse, when Elon Musk says something, it is still news. I do think it's worth slowing down. And I think this is where people get tripped up because the impulse in news is often just publish as quickly as you can because the audience wants the news now. And to the degree that you can like slow yourself down, call some experts, get some other takes from people who are in the field. So if we're talking about batteries, that means, you know, there are a lot of folks in academia who do great work on batteries. You can call them up. They'll talk to you. Um, they can tell you what they think is real, what they think isn't real, what they are skeptical about, what they're not skeptical about, all of those things. Just getting those sorts of moments of of just like almost like a gut check from people who are experts is a really good way to handle that. And it's one of the reasons why, like, if you follow the Verge's coverage of Elon Musk, you know, if there's an event, we'll report on the event. And then the next day, there are a series of stories about like us calling experts and seeing what they think. And if you know what's going to be in the event, it's often possible to line up the experts ahead of time and then just get them on the phone and put them in the story right away. So I think that that is like a really good backstop is to to talk to people who would know. And one of the things about Theranos that I noticed in some of this coverage, I want to be clear, the, like these folks were not science reporters. Like Roger Parloff, who wrote that uh, Big Fortune article, he's a legal reporter. That's where his area of expertise is. So I don't expect him to necessarily know how to do this. But he needed to call some pathologists. And like a lot of times when people were being cited as being impressed by Theranos tech, they weren't pathologists. They weren't people who were working directly in that field. And there was even like, I'm going to totally botch his name because I've never said it aloud before. I'm very sorry. Uh, John Iannodanus had written um, before the Carrie Rue thing came out about his skepticism about Theranos tech because the evidence wasn't there. And I think that you know, that might have been worth mentioning in some of these articles. Now, I thought that the New Yorker article was a lot more skeptical than some of the other things that I saw about Theranos. <laughs> in fact, even calling Holmes's uh, characterization of the tech comically vague, which like the New Yorker is secretly a very bitchy magazine. That was like <laughs> definitely shade. You know, I, I, I think that it's worth just slowing down a little um, and thinking about like, who can I talk to to gut check this instead of just like assuming it's true. And how do you think that interacts with the incentives around a company like Theranos, where if they feel a journalist is checking too deeply into their claims, we'll cut them off from all future access? I think access kills. 
<laughs> like I know that I, uh, I, so my, my quote unquote real job, um, although I do write is that I'm an editor. And so I'm often the person who's making some of these calls on reporters stories. And if someone says, you know, if you do this, we won't talk to you again. I'm inclined to put both middle fingers up and do it. We don't, we don't actually need to talk to you to write about you. Like that's, that's fine. And that's certainly, uh, I think, an impulse that a lot of other journalists share. So that's kind of where I come from here is like, oh, we'll cut you out. You'll never you'll never talk to us again. Like, I don't have to. Are there any other points you would like to make uh, about either the trial or about the about Elizabeth Holmes or about, yeah, any any anything in particular? Well, there's one thing that has sort of stuck with me, and I don't know if this applies to your interest in cryptocurrency, but it might. A lot of the investors that I saw in the Theranos trial were family offices that were really excited to get in on the startup boom. And I want to be clear, WeWork did not do anything illegal. But a lot of the people who were really excited to get into um, a real estate company that was pretending to be a tech company were not VCs, but like pe like Fidelity and a bunch of other folks who like were just like, oh, this is where the action is now. And so as you're thinking about it, who's investing and like what their level of expertise is, I actually think that the rise of the family office and there's a, a big uh, economist article about how how rapidly they've risen as global wealth has risen. I think they're a really ripe target for fraud. And I think that that's sort of flying under the radar right now. So if I were running a family office, I might want to expand my due diligence operations because if I am a fraudster, I know exactly where I'm going. I'm going to the family offices because they don't know better. Well, and, and they're really easy to do what Holmes did and to run an affinity scam against. Find someone that the family office knows and trusts, have them on your board, have them make the introduction and be there for the meeting. And you're already 80% of the way to the investment just because they already trust this person so much. That's right. I am curious to see how this rise of the family office is going to wind up playing out globally because I think that they're I think they're dumb money. Yeah. Poignant last statement. So thank you. Thank you for joining us, Liz. It was really a pleasure to have you. And uh, and hopefully we get to have you on sometime again soon. <laughs> I hope so. It's been fun, guys. Bye.